Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Well, this is a continuation of our uh, series on Christmas carols uh, theme. This is for our, really, this is just for mine and Jean Marie's entertainment. We really, this makes it easy for us. It's like, I've never, I've never given a talk on a Christmas carol before. This is really fun. And um, I know she did a beautiful job last time on Jingle Bells. How many of you were here for Jingle Bells? Yeah? That was good. So uh, today we're doing Angels We Have Heard on High, if you haven't already figured that part out or read the s slide up there. But what I wanted to um, kind of mention is that um, as, we're, as we're looking at this, you know, um, Michael did um, the Annunciation um, story, basically. That's um, the, the announcement of the angel Gabriel uh, to Mary that she would be carrying Jesus and that, and that she would become pregnant and, and also gave a, prophes you know, a prophecy for the child that she would carry and very um, grand and, and huge impact in, in terms. And so um, it's, it's really wonderful to see how angels really figure in, not only into Christian um, into the Christian scriptures, but into the Hebrew scriptures. Angels are, are, are all throughout that as well, in that tradition, in Islam, and in many other traditions as well. Angels or angelic beings or those beings from the other side. And I'm just kind of curious, you know, there was a time, I'm thinking it was like in the late 80s, maybe 90s, where it, there was like this huge shift of angel stuff and angel lore and angel cards. I mean, we still have the, some of those things, but I mean, it's just like a really big angel movement. I don't know if it, many of you remember that. So I'm wondering if, you know, you uh, have received what you think is angelic message, that you've seen an angel, some people see angels, um, or have had a, the sense that some human being, some contact, something seemed like it was from another world, or, you know, a human contact where somebody says something um, beyond their capability of knowing how important that would be to you. How many of you have had any of those experiences? That's kind of what I figured. I mean, you know, this isn't unfamiliar territory to us, and it isn't necessary that we believe in angels because angels don't need for us to believe in them um, to exist. And, and so uh, we find that true about a lot of facts. I'm just going to say that. So, um, so there's, there's this idea that we have to believe in something to make it real, and, that, um, and, the, and the truth is it helps for us to utilize the information that is coming to us when we actually engage with it and when we use it. But it isn't necessary for us to, um, to engage with something or to, to, to believe in something in order to really be affected by it, to be impacted, or to be benefited. So I'm going to change the subject, or seem to, for a moment. In my walks um, along the bayou, for many years, and um, on my walks in the hill country, I would always pay attention to the path I was walking. Um, I'm, I'm, I love rocks. I will pick up a, a, a pretty rock, even in a national park. Oh, that's right. This is, on, this is being recorded. I mean, if I think it's a really pretty rock, and I think there's a lot of others, I just might. I'll turn it over and see if it doesn't have my name on the back of it. I'll just make sure, because I just really feel like sometimes it's mine. So anyway, I, I'll look for those kinds of things, but I often, I would often find feathers. And I've been collecting feathers for such a long time. I have a big bag of all kinds of bird feathers, mostly common bird feathers, but I also have collected some unusual bird feathers, some long ones, some big ones that I know belong to birds of prey, and others that I really couldn't name from the feathers. But I just find them so mystical and so important that I have been collecting them for some time and, and attributing some understanding. Very often, I think of it as a brush with the infinite, you know? I feel like they've come from 
Even if they came from a bird that dropped something right next to me, I just feel like there's a communion with something alive, whether it's a conscious thing or not. It's something that links us and connects us, you know? And often it would confirm an insight or a plan that I was, you know, considering at the time. In native traditions, birds are seen as messengers from the divine, birds themselves. And the feathers are symbols that are used in rituals to connect um, thoughts and prayers, to send thoughts and prayers up to the divine. They're also the ways in which the divine sends messages back to us. And so it isn't so unusual for us as human beings to pay attention to our connections to unexpected things and little clues and that sort of thing, you know? Because in fact, as limitless as the universe is, it is in fact a closed system. Everything is intimately connected with everything else. And while things seem so far flung, they couldn't possibly be related. In truth, there is no place for anything to go but here. And there's no other time but right now. And so everything in our awareness and things that come into our awareness all come from the same source of wisdom and love and life. And so in opening ourselves to paying attention to those clues and to those things, angelic beings then become um, another way for us to commune, whether it's in our imaginations, whether it's in our dreams, whether it's in our visions, or whether it's through human beings acting as um, messengers to us in some kind of spiritually connected way. When we look up into the sky, there is a sense of the immensity and the wonder, even in a daylight sky. But I think it's even magnified more in a dark sky at night where you can just feel the immensity. And if you're so lucky as to be somewhere where you can see some stars, then you also get lost in just recognizing as you contemplate that that what you're looking at is another whole solar system in the tiny sparkle of a tiny light so far millions and billions of miles away. It's beyond our comprehension, and yet we can take it for granted if we don't pay attention. No wonder we associate the sky and bird feathers that might drift down from the sky with the divine. Lucrina Whitaker says, Holiness comes wrapped in the ordinary. There are burning bushes all around you. Every tree is full of angels. Hidden beauty is waiting in every crumb. If we began to strip away the routine and the ordinary and we take a step back into our native selves, into our infinite selves, into our childlike selves, into our wonder selves, the parts of us that are still deeply connected to all things, all time, when we spend some time in repose, we can recognize that we are far more vulnerable and accessible to divine message, to divine connection, to becoming conscious of, of meanings and, um, and, and uh, blessings that can come to us through encounters with others or just alone in the world, walking in the beautiful expanse of nature. Anywhere, anywhere where a living thing grows is a place of meditation. If we are tune ourselves to that, we are awash in the possibility of communion with something greater. 
Angels are etheric beings, and they don't actually come and go. If you read about them in the scriptures, any of the, 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 the Christian or Judaic scriptures, they don't, like, come and go, they, even if they have wings. Sometimes they're, they're talked about as having wings or, or being a winged thing, something with feathers. But they don't seem to use them because they, they don't really fly in the window or fly in the doorway. They simply appear in a radiant light, and then they simply disappear. See, the realm of not logical becomes strictly intuitive. This isn't logical, which is where those who choose not to believe dwell in this idea that if it doesn't make sense, they're freed. But in some ways, they're actually disconnecting themselves from something that is the true freedom which is our connection with all of everything, of all wisdom, all life. And so, in opening ourselves to this possibility of being in that kind of right brain living, um, Martha Beck says this, whether you've seen angels floating around your bedroom or just found a ray of hope at a lonely moment, choosing to believe that something unseen is caring for you can be a life-shifting exercise. Something unseen cares about you. You don't have to name it. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to know it. You just have to open to it. And then your world starts to get bigger and grander and sparkly and more beautiful, and safer, and more powerful, and more possible. Breathing into our hearts and having courage to feel what we feel, to listen expecting to hear, to be alert expecting to see, these are the ways that we allow angels to bring messages from the divine. Whatever form, whatever ways, whatever time, whatever the need, wherever we are. Dr. Rachel Naomi Riemann, um, um, uh, uh, she's a pediatrician uh, by training, but she spent a good deal of her practice in her later years working with um, cancer, terminal patients and cancer patients that as a counselor, sort of like to, to escort them through finding meaning in their illness and also in, in, their, uh, in their lives. And there was a Japanese man named a hero who had uh, terminal cancer, who was highly educated, very principled man, high integrity, he was a family man, and had many of their sessions that she had with him during the course of his, uh, her caring, with him, caring for him during his uh, illness, would often turn to discussions of death because he was terminal and he had no longer sought treatment at that point. And those discussions of death, he would often challenge her to tell him what she knew of death, someone who had, was working in that medium of death, so to speak, walking people so close to the edge. And he would ask her what she knew of death, and she would repeatedly say, you know, I don't know for sure. So during one of their next-to-last meetings, she said, he again raised the issue with me. Hearing my I don't know, he began to laugh. Rachel, he said, I'm an educated man. I must believe that death is the end. But just in case it isn't, I will come back as a great white crane and give you some sort of sign that I have lost this argument. 
And then this tall and elegant man stood, putting both hands in an exquisite gesture so that for a heart-stopping moment, he became a great white bird, a crane, just stood there until they both broke out in laughter. Something about showing up as a great white crane is a little obvious, I told him. Do you remember that duck on the Groucho Marx show that used to drop down on a string whenever a guest inadvertently said the mystery word? Yeah, yes, he said, chuckling. It's not really my style, though. I'm more of a minimalist, he said. So I told him, I said, well, perhaps you'll find another way. He looked at me for a considered moment. He said, I will do something that you will recognize. Only a few mo months later, this remarkable man died. Shortly afterward, I was in the Transamerica building, a large pyramid-shaped structure in the downtown business district of San Francisco, waiting for an elevator to take me to an appointment. The building is tall, and so the elevators are quite slow. This gives everyone a few minutes to themselves. And in this brief time, I found myself thinking of a hero and how much I missed being able to talk with him. We had spoken so many times. I remembered some of the many extraordinary things I had discovered about him and what a delightful man he had been. At last, one of the elevators arrived, and it was empty. And so, with my heart and mind filled with memories of this relationship, I stepped inside. The doors closed, and the elevator started upward so abruptly that I was thrown slightly off balance. I glanced down hurriedly to regain my footing in there, Lying on the floor of the elevator was a large, single, perfect, white feather. Howard Thurman says, there must be always remaining in every life some place for the singing of angels, some place for that which in itself is breathless and beautiful, some place for that which in itself is breathless and beautiful. Take advantage of this season to listen for angels that you hear on high. Take advantage of this childlike memory field that Christmas really is. Sparkly and glittery, impossibly lovely and joyous and trashy at times. <laughs> but whatever it is for you, however it appears to you, whatever you see, stay alert. Check into your feelings. Keep alert. Listen. Keep your eyes focused. If we listen for angels from on high, singing to each of us, they will sing a song only we can hear. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. And the mountains in reply, echoing their glorious chains. Gloria in excelsis bless you all. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live 
on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.